Hi, I'm Pam Linemiller, host of Future Foodcast. I want to thank our sponsor, Farm to Plate, a software company building tomorrow's food ecosystem today. And our guest today has got a great background and a really fun business going on. We have Wing Lamb. He is co-founder of Wahoo's Fish Tacos. Welcome to the podcast, Wing. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to jump into some of the really fun things that you're doing right now. But before we get started, take us back to how Wahoo's Fish Tacos even got started, how this all came about. Well, you got a few kids, me and my two little brothers, Ed and Mingo, right? We grew up in Brazil, of all places. Parents immigrated, you know, there after World War II. We were born and raised there. We come to America. My parents have been into Chinese food their entire lives. We all go to college and say, hey, do you guys want to take over the business? And we said, nah, we have maybe different things we want to do. And they said, hey, but maybe we want to do something fun. So the idea is we tried corporate, wasn't that much fun. So I said, we know how to do the restaurants. And I said, what about doing a surf inspired themed restaurant? And that's what we wanted to do. But we couldn't really do just Brazilian food because it wasn't really that popular 35 years ago in California. And the hottest food cuisine in California then was Mexican. So we said, let's bring the little Asian inspired Brazilian flavors and Mexican all together and create this little place for surfers to hang out. And as we say, the rest is history. Wow. And how long ago was that? 35 years ago? 35 years ago, 1988. Yeah. Still going strong, which yeah. is something to say, especially after the last few years with what happened with the pandemic? How did that affect you? Well, it was almost like restarting the clock again. In Within two days of announcing that not all non-essential business should shut down, but then in small print, restaurants are okay to stay open. Well, nobody saw that. So basically from Wednesday till Friday, 85% of our business vanished, just gone. The business was gone. I mean, it was like a ghost town. So we ended up having to furlough, lay off about 85% of our staff. So a restaurant that typically would have had about 15 people working a lunch shift was down to three, a cashier, wow. a cook, and a server, basically. And that pretty much stayed for about a year. And then slowly things started going up. Things would go back down. Patios were open. Patios were not take out only drive through all these different renditions. Mm -hmm. So the most affected area for us is uh, LA. I mean, LA County was just super, super strict in terms of what you could do. So we ended up losing almost all the stores in LA. Uh, well, well, for our audience, which is across the globe, Wing, I'm just going to give them a little bit of context. You're sure. mainly focused in California. Yep. Uh, Los Angeles, LA and LA County is that kind of greater Los Angeles area. And that yep. was really the most affected. I think they had very strict lockdowns as well when the pandemic hit. Yeah. And also, I think you know, a combination of people following the rules, where I would say Orange County was a lot more, uh, we don't want to follow anything because we're in Orange County, we're the land of the free kind of a thing. So you have this constant mask, no mask, vaccine, no vaccine, all this stuff going on. And then also in Orange County, they were opening like makeshift outdoor patios. So you saw street closures, creating like downtown space, the outdoor dining facilities, where LA was pretty much like, we're not doing any of that. And what was happening is all the people from LA were traveling to Orange County <laughs> for the, you know, to go to the beaches and a little bit of the freedom. So we had to reinvent ourselves because we not only, like I said, lost all that business. And I'm like trying to figure it out. They're not coming in. So I call it an accident slash, you know, opportunity is we sent all the employees home with all the food we could give it to them. But we still had stuff that was prepped and it was going to go bad. Mm -hmm. So I thought, why don't we cook it and take it to the hospitals where things were going really going crazy? Yeah. So I ended up calling a few of my friends in the Long Beach area. So we visited literally four different hospitals in Long Beach in a matter of days. And then I said, oh, my God, people are really appreciative. We should do more of this mm -hmm. and repurpose our food. 
And that's when my kid brother Mingo said, well, Wayne, that's really, really, you know, admirable of you to do this. But remember, we're out of money. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I Somebody said, has to watch the finances. Obviously, that was him, not you. Yes. So I said, you know, well, what do you mean? It goes, well, not only are we out of money, uh, we're probably going to have to shut down additional stores in Orange County because we really don't have any business in between, you know, overhead and rent. It's cheaper just to pay the rent and not have any additional labor and all that. Because again, it was like $300 a day just in labor. So I said, okay, so what do we need to do? Because, well, you need to figure it out how you can get some money. So that's when I got creative. I called my friends that were in the business. First, I said, hey, let's all work together instead, instead of against each other. So Yogurland was a major one, Monster Energy Drink and Hints, because I figured they all had product that was going to expire anyway. Right. So I said, now together we can say, hey, we can cover our costs. We can find somebody to cover it. So then that's why I called all my charity partners. And literally, uh, Charles Anthus was one of the first guys because he happened to call me about my short hours. And I says, what are you doing? He goes, are you kidding me? I'm at home. He goes, how about you come out with us? And let's go make a delivery. And he said, are you crazy? The mandate for our entire company is to stay at home. And he's a roofing company. Okay. And, and I said, okay, I know you are, but put your mask on, put your gloves on, put your face shield on and, and come and see what we're doing. Yeah. And more importantly, I need, I need a little bit of your money. And he goes, okay, because all the charity events got canceled as well. Right. A few hundred dollars. We went to a few more hospitals. And after a couple more, the light bulb went on because we ended up at Chalk Hospital, which is Children's Hospital of Orange County. Yeah. And he realized that the nurses that took care of his premature babies oh. were the ones working double shifts. And all of a sudden it was, oh my God, we can actually thank the people that took care of us. Yeah. And then he says, let's bring in my vendors, my other suppliers, my subs. So he brought his lighting guy. He brought his, you know, uh, landscaping, security, insurance. And they're all like, what are you guys doing? I'm like, come and see. Yeah. And Learning then, a new business. That's what we're <laughs> Yeah. So all of a sudden we found ourselves, you know, going to all the hospitals. And then other companies started joining in. Subaru of North America, Bear Paint. Uh, Loan Depot. And they said, well, we guys are crazy. It was no, we're just taking care of the frontliners and right. we just need a little bit of money. And they started saying, well, we'd love to help you. And they said, can we pick a hospital where we know a nurse or we know a doctor? Goes, Absolutely. Because all the hospitals were jam packed. Yeah. So it became this movement. And we thought, all joking aside, you know, in April of 2020, yeah, they said, 30 days, maybe short 60. term. Yes, yeah. short term. That's what we and thought. It was forever. It was literally two years yeah. of just going to hospitals, to, you know, and police stations because everything that happened in Minnesota, the whole police department was all, you know, in shambles out here. A lot yeah. of you fund me, you know, deals. Amazing. Yeah. Well, and just the great story of turning a bad situation or a challenging situation and seeing, well, how can we turn this into a positive? What can we do instead of yeah. looking at all the negatives of, of what's shut down and what we can't do, what's happening, people not coming into the restaurants? You decided to move that into a positive, especially with all that was going on in the world. I mean, everybody was unsure. We just didn't know what the next step was going to be. And, um, you know, it's a little bit of a bright light in the middle of all that. I love your positive attitude. And I think there are a lot of entrepreneurs like yourself. I mean, you and your brothers are very entrepreneurial, co-found, you know, co-founding this restaurant chain and um, building maybe on something, some things that you learned as young people with, from your parents. But still, that whole entrepreneurial journey is one of what have we got and what can we do with it? And you just figured that out and brought some other people along with you. I, I just love the positive about that. Uh, well, how did you get the word out? Because, you know, nobody, all we ever heard about was the pandemic, the pandemic. Like how did you let the hospitals know you were coming ahead or how did you figure out where you were needed or, you know, what kind of promotion was happening? Well, the interesting part is once you deliver to one hospital, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hey, and, and the word is, I mean, remember, pre-pandemic, we were already doing things with all the hospitals anyway, as part of yeah. the normal giving. 
But once things got really strict, because remember, the idea of bringing a whole pizza and multiple people grabbing was like, yeah. no more. Yeah. So we have to figure out how to individually make meals. That yeah. was literally grab and go. You didn't need a fork and knife. Because remember, all the nurses were running around. So they would literally grab. So we figured out our menu was, let's make a burrito because you don't need utensils to eat a burrito, right? It's self-contained in a side of tortilla. And we'll make it different flavors. And we basically will label it and bring like 20 to two to 300, right? So, and then I said, hey, but while you're grabbing and going, a little cup of yogurt, you know, and the drinks. So everything kind of fit almost like you're going, you know, like you were a kid in high school. It was a little brown bag with everything in it, right? So things started moving and everybody just started calling each other. And the other factor is there's this huge human, you know, like product because it has to be quote unquote safe. I had the notoriety because I, as a brand, people already knew all the things I did in the community. So a lot of other restaurants tried to do the same thing, but because you've never done it, meaning the community doesn't know that you're a giver, they're yeah. looking at you goes, no, thank you, but you know, no, thank you. Because they saw that as an opportunistic kind of approach as mm -hmm. more of a giving approach. Right. Where they knew that I was a big part of the community. So nobody questioned my motives. Okay. Where everybody else was like, oh, it's okay, but thank you. You know, we, we're right. okay right now. So right. a lot of people had a hard time getting into the big hospitals because you said the coverage and all the, the things that came yeah. with it, right? Yeah. yeah. But they saw that and goes, well, you're really only doing this because you want the press. Where we were just coming in was we know, and this is where we knew where the patients were, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, tell me about the press. Like what? Tell me about that. You just okay. want the press. Like what? The interesting part is in the absence of all this, I call negative, you know, news. Every day is about death count and about how many new positive cases, right? We were this little bright light of a group of us going out and delivering, taking care of the nurses. So uh, KLOS, which is one of the biggest radio stations in Southern California, we had a great partnership with them before the pandemic. Okay. So be us being one of the few partners that were out doing anything, uh, they saw that as another something to talk about, something good. Mm -hmm. So Heidi and Frank said, hey, can we partner with you guys? And we said, well, what do you mean? It goes, how about we use our broadcasting capability to create a GoFundMe page for you guys and have the listeners that are at home, maybe they can't go out, but maybe they can contribute to help you guys go out. And I'm like, you guys would do that? They're like, absolutely. So they're probably uh, craving some positive news in all this negative, right? Wing. Yeah. I mean, so once a week on Fridays, now it's been literally over three years. They created a platform for us to talk about it on the radio. And again, it was, uh, I would say, six months before I actually ever went into the station live. But the rest of the time, we just call in. They go, like, hey, I, I, I got a hotline number to call in the station. And we would talk about where we had been and where we were going. And it was also a way for us to thank some of the donors, some sure. of our partners. And so again, here we are talking about, you know, Antis Roofing, Yogurtland, all these brands. And they're like, who is doing all this? Because, well, there's this guy, Wayne, who, yes. if you team up with him, in the absence of any other good news happening, you're going to get this feel good because here I am. So that was on the radio. KTLA, our good buddy Henry DeCarlo from, you know, KTLA Weather, he goes, well, wait, any chance we can do, we'll help you broadcast this story. Wow. So all of this helped us really get notice for everybody and, you know, a little bit of, you know, pat on the back, but more important, the, the funding, because people are like, you guys are crazy. You guys are going out, but so let us send you some money. And so no, the movement- You're was, crazy enough to do this. We'll support you. Uh, you go out. I'm staying home. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It was great.
Yeah. But, well, but but first of all, you are already known in the community for your attitude, you and your brothers and your company for being very charitable. So like you said, you could get your foot in the door and then you brought friends with you and it was good PR for everyone and, and a feel good story. And you were actually serving communities that need to be served, those first responders that were just, you know, there there wasn't a fast food place open for them to run down the street at a break and they weren't getting a break. They needed to grab and go. Like you're saying, just seemed like you met so many of those needs, but coming out of that, then you're still involved in so much charity work. And and I guess you're involved in some before, but are you involved in more now as a result of this? Yeah. So what happened is uh, some of the ones that we weren't involved with as much uh, work in wardrobe, uh, we've done a lot of stuff with the military where uh, civilians are coming uh, you're transitioning back to civilian life. Right. So the same thing during the pandemic, we were the only people that could bring lunches to them without having to serve, meaning open containers, all the you, the usual yeah. catering, I call it. We would right. bring grab and go lunches. So as they would go through that, uh, I would say I got to know more hospitals than I've ever, you know, had met before. I got to become friends with almost all the police chiefs, fire chiefs. That if I knew one, like say the Newport in my neighborhood, then I got to know all the other ones because they all heard, hey, I heard he went to Huntington Beach. How about coming to Tustin? How about coming yes. to Orange, right? So it became yeah. this really cool movement. And uh, I think shelters. So a lot of people that we had heard of before, but we hadn't worked with, this gave us an opportunity to work with them. So it was just this really cool moment. So now uh, as all the events are back together, we're getting, you know, say, hey, let us come and help you. And I think the big one, uh, I would say the American Red Cross, where we were doing maybe once a year uh, in the month of May, where, you know, it's the big blood drive. Yeah. All of a sudden, my buddy Antos Roofing was hosting blood drives in his building because half of it was empty. And it's oh, wow. still empty, by the way. So we are like approaching our 100th blood drive there. So the same thing. And at the very beginning, we said, well, Charles, how are you going to let people know that you're doing this? And he goes, well, what do you mean? We're just going to put it out on social media. He goes, well, it's again, things happen for a reason, I call it. I said, the media partner for the blood drive is KLOS, right? The yeah. food partner is me. So together, we're going to make these the best drug, blood drives in Orange County. And that's what it's been for three years. It's the only place where you come, instead of just getting a little thing of orange juice and a little pack of gummies, right? right. You actually get lunch, you get frozen yogurt, and you get drinks. So yes, Wayne, can you come to Atlanta? I'm giving blood later this <laughs> week. And I need, I need to have lunch. I, I'm not going to, I'll probably get a little thing of orange juice and a pack of gummies, or if I'm lucky, maybe some, you know, some cookies or something. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I'd rather have a lunch from your place, but we're across the country from one another at this point. So I, I can, I can dream about it though. Yes, that, that's, just, that's just a great story though, using the empty office space and, and it's continued on. That's the thing. Now you're known, you have a reputation for what's going on. Well, tell me also, so that's in the charitable side, but what about your restaurants? What's happening right now with, with your restaurants? Well, right now, I mean, we're the only major issue, I mean, and across the country, you know, it's, yeah. it's not just us, it's the industry, but in the restaurant specifically, food costs has gone up about 50% because of, you know, fuel and all that. And then labor has also gone up about another 50%. So I call the old artificial minimum wage, you know, was supposed to have been about 15, you know, whatever, raised to from 10 to 15. Yeah. Right now you're looking at almost $20 an hour. Yeah. And across the board, you can't get kids to work because it just so happened that this whole generation right now has the, the you know, quote, unquote, they love to use their phones, right? So they don't like to interact. So they're used to ordering through their app. They're used to talking via text. And again, the whole face-to-face -face interaction has kind of gone away. So what happens is during the pandemic, uh, retailers in general were the ones hit the hardest. If, i.e., you went to a restaurant and somebody said, hey, please, customer, can you wear a mask? Well, you ended up with these little confrontations where, you know, yelling, and the kids, they don't really want to deal with the public. 
let alone dealing with an angry customer. So right now, I, I say, if I have to look for the future, right? We talked a little bit about this is we're going to have a whole generation that doesn't understand customer interaction. Uh, basically, they don't want to deal with the public. Well, at some point, you're going to have to learn the people skill. And the old us, we learned it in a fast food environment, things that basically you learn how to deal with older people that were angry and you learn how to diffuse the situation because we all know that the customer is right, right? But within reason, well, he's never always right, right? So it's easy for us to deal with when we see it, we know how to deal with the situation. But the kids right now, they don't want to go back to work. They really don't want to deal with the public. So you're going to have this whole, you know, 20, 30 years from now, and they're like, they're not going to be able to deal with anything. They're going to be having, you know, issues, you know, having to deal with, you know, angry customers, all that stuff that's happening. And it's all because right now we can't get them to work. So anyway, yeah, just the whole gen- idea that, you know, the labor is so expensive right now, it's literally up 50%. So the new quote unquote minimum wage in California is around $20 an hour. But the main issue of trying to get the this generation of kids to come to work is it thought that they have to deal with the public because the this generation, they're used to talking via text messaging and they don't basically, they order, they do everything via text, right? So I they're not going to see the emotions, the anger. So when you end up, facing a customer for the first time, you're like, oh my God, he's yelling at me and you don't know how to react, right? So it's going to be a fun and terrible issue in a few more years when they become adults and they can't deal with their spouses. They can't deal with their you know, neighbors because the whole face-to-face communication, they don't know how to deal with somebody that's angry or somebody to disagree with them. This is such an interesting perspective that you're bringing to the table, Wing. Because I mean, yes, we're we're talking about food and the yeah. things that are happening in the food space, but also the future of food. And what I'm hearing you say is, I mean, that has changed. I mean, going to a restaurant, um, it, the whole picture of restaurants and customer service and everything has changed, and yeah. the workers that you used to get to work in your restaurants, it's different. And they're not getting that exposure in, I, I call them the soft skills, like those people skills, yes. the interactivity, interacting with others because of really our technology and our automation and how they've grown up. That's that's an interesting, any, any kind of customer service position, really. You think about any kind of retail, food or other, you know, it's all changed. Things are really automating. And I'm not sure what the answer is to help that generation as they're coming along. I don't know that I have any answers for that. I don't know if you do either. You've identified it as a unique, it's a unique perspective. I haven't really heard that before. Yeah. Like you said, you use the right word, people skill. So you can learn just about everything in school. They can teach you that. But people skill comes with dealing with people. Yeah. And you can't learn it. They can't say, hey, when somebody says this, all you got to do is do this. Well, if that was the case, we be all have no issues, right? But when the customer goes irate and you don't know why, you got to have the ability to think, it was, well, was it this? Was it before he came to me? It was his kids, his wife. Where did that anger come from? Because it's not just the food. The food was the last piece that pushed them over. Good so point. <laughs> you're it. You, the server, the cashier, the busboy, you're going to get the brunt of it. And it's not personal. You just got to diffuse it and figure it out how to basically say, hey, it's not that big of a deal, right? Right. That, that whole today, empathy. Yeah. yeah. Just empathizing with them and realizing it's not what just happened. It's what happened probably along the way and before they came to you and had your interaction, because what happened with your interaction really isn't that big of a deal in in the grand scheme of things, right? Just trying to figure out how to deal with that. I think, um, I think you need to get involved with young people wing somehow. (laughs) I I mean, 
I try to spend as much time as I can visiting the high schools and the colleges and just lecturing. And I explain to them the whole idea, you know, because people still believe it because it's it's not about what you know, it's about who you know. All right. So that therefore, like for instance, in California, USC happens to have a huge network, you know, University of Southern California. It's a private school. I think these days we're approaching almost a hundred thousand dollars a year to go there. So oh it's not a cheap God. day to go there. But if you look at all the majority of the businesses and all the big companies in Southern California, there's a huge USC connection, whether it's sports marketing, uh, film, all this stuff, because, you know, the universe is so powerful and not to mention the sports program. Right. So most kids I, I hear from them was I'm going to go there because of the network. So I always try to explain to them, but that's a really good thinking. I like what you're thinking, but let me say it in a nice way that it will make you understand. Everybody in Southern California will say, do you know Michael Jordan? There's not a single person that will say, oh, I don't know who Michael Jordan is. Of course, everybody knows that. The question is, does Michael Jordan know you? Mm. The answer is zero, right? So yes, it's about who you know, but more important is who knows you. Because if you're not the man, nobody cares about you. They don't care that you went to SC, UCLA, or wherever you went to. Right. You have zero value to them. But if you're Michael Jordan, you are of huge value to them, whatever that means, because they know you and people want to come to you. They want to do business with you because they know you. Yeah. But just because you went to a major university, I hate to tell you, there's 10,000 kids graduating a year from that university. What makes you stand out of the 10,000? Were you the starting quarterback of that college? Were you the starting point guard? If you weren't, get in line. Because there's 10,000 other kids graduating from all the other universities ahead of you. Yeah. So people don't understand. It's your people skill. It's your accomplishments. It's what you've done that will add to the network. That's why people want to hire you. So that's the thing. It's like when you go to a job interview, I got a degree. Guess what? How many people graduate from college every year? They have a similar degree. So that's where the people skill and all the things like all your accomplishments. And again, doesn't mean just athletics. It doesn't mean anything, but just well-rounded. And yes, my additional skills besides my degree is going to add value to this company. And that's why they should hire you. So what I'm hearing is, well, because it's going to be a minority of students that are, you know, the quarterback of the football team or the point guard on the basketball team yeah. or have some ability in that area. And it is. It could be every student who went out of their way to volunteer in a certain place, or to you know provide um, a service, or to have a part-time job where they got experience in this area. And I hear what you're saying. Like they have to take responsibility for their own personal growth, and yes. that speaks volumes to a business owner like you, as they're coming out, and and other business owners that are looking to hire younger workers, they really want, you know, somebody with that, that attitude a little bit, not waiting for things to be handed to them, but going after um, growing and expanding what they need to do personally in order to be valuable to a company and a business. Yeah, absolutely. Whether it's my restaurant or any other job out there, it's, hey, we're going to pay you to do this. But what else can you bring to make it better? Because mm -hmm. again, just because my tacos be made, be made a certain way for 35 years, doesn't mean that you may not have a better way to make it. I challenge the kids to say, hey, here's a better, more efficient way to do it or something that tastes better, that costs less, whatever that innovation may be. Mm -hmm. We're always looking for that. Open to, open to innovation. Well, obviously you've done very well being cutting edge and, and being de in demand for 35 years. And we've, we've talked about a lot of different topics today, but Wing, is there anything else you want to share with our audience before we go? Well, you know, I always tell them is like, hey, you can go work for somebody and figure it out. Hey, I like being where I'm at. Or if you think you can do it better, right? And there's no right and there's no wrong answer, right? So to me, I say, hey, come and, you know, cut your teeth with me. I love the fact that one of my former employees now owns a couple of bars 
you know, and he's doing amazingly well. And he and I will always talk about the skills that you learn. And the most important one, people skill. Because that, no matter what you do in your life, that's where it's at. And it just so happened that the food industry is the easiest and best place to work at to get those skills. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing all that you do uh, in California and LA and surrounding areas and what you did over the pandemic, how successful Wahoo's tacos are. And uh, I can't wait to try one when I come to LA next. I was there last summer, but I did not have a taco. I'm definitely going to be coming to one of your restaurants when I come to town. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. And I want to also thank our sponsor, Farm to Plate. They are creating a better food supply chain system. If you want to know more, you can check them out at farmtoplate.io. Thanks for listening to Future Foodcasts. Future Foodcast is powered by Farm to Plate, the leading food blockchain platform. Subscribe on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts to stay up to date with the very latest innovations in the food industry. 